Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Olya Marcinj Klors. I'm the pediatric nephrologist here. I am um, here in place of Dr. Leonard to introduce our grand art speaker today to Dr. To, together with Dr. Gruber. Um, started so first to acknowledge that um, uh, we recognize the Stanford system the ancestral land of the Moekma Ohlone tribe. Um, uh, also to let everybody know and remind that if you uh, use a text code or 44897 um, to the number to the left, you can confirm your attendance. And also please don't forget as you get an evaluations email to uh, give us your feedback and potentially get MOC credit and give us suggestions for future topics. Um, today, uh, we have um, uh, our lovely speaker, Dr. Gregory Armstrong from uh, St. Jude Children's uh, Research Hospital. And I'd like Dr. Gruber to give a, um, a detailed introduction of his work and the topic today of the lifetime impact of childhood cancer, cancer therapy. But as a reminder of upcoming grand rounds, coming up on February 3rd is, uh, is another one of our health equity rounds. Um, this time, successes in future work. And this will be presented by our lovely faculty, Dr. Blacharczyk, Varaka Floyd, Alison Guren, uh, Rebecca Kameni, Shamina Punjabi, and Amit Singh. Um, after that, on February 10th, we have our uh, safety lecture, well, which will be given by Dr. Tomi from Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and one more announcement in collaboration with Mid-Coastal California Perinatal Outreach Program, our Stanford faculty um, um, puts together uh, uh, um, an annual perinatal potpourri, um, Advances in Care. This will be on March 23rd and 24th. And um, some things that uh, will be addressed are team-based care for infants with renal or digestive airway and palliative care needs, continuum between fear maternal morbidity and mortality, and diabetes-related pregnancy complications, please, this is a webinar, and feel free to register. Um, moving forward, I will um, let Dr. Gruber introduce our speaker, who will be speaking about childhood cancer survival, uh, given that the rates have significantly improved over the past 50 years, with over 85% of all children diagnosed with cancer expected to survive. However, they do have challenges after uh, we have achieved this success in their survival, and we will be addressing those today. Um, Dr. Gruber is um, here, and uh, she is our Division Chief of Hematology and Oncology and also Director of the S Center, and I'll let her introduce. Thank you so much uh, for attending. Greg, uh, there are 83 participants on Zoom, so just so you know, <laughs> people are very excited that you're here today. So Dr. Armstrong uh, completed his medical degree at the University of Alabama and then went on to do his um, postgraduate training internship residency fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where he also obtained a master's um, in epi. And he then went to St. Jude, uh, first job out of um, training, and he stayed there uh, since that time and has gone up through the ranks and is now a full member. He is a co-leader of the survivorship program along with Melissa, Melissa Hudson, and he is the newly appointed chair of epidemiology and cancer control at St. Jude, which is very well deserved and a long time coming. Greg has made so many contributions to the field for our cancer survivors. Uh, in particular, of no, a lot of really important work done on cardiac uh, complications of our cancer survivors. Whenever I hear him speak, I oh, am always guilty about all the anthracyclines that I'm ordering on my AML patients. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, in the future, we can really help um, these patients by, by being able to decrease their exposure to those drugs. So I just want to say on a personal note, when I was first at St. Jude, we have a similar weekly grand rounds. It's called the Danny Thomas Lecture Series. And mostly it's external speakers, but um, I think quarterly or so we'll have an internal speaker. And I remember as a junior faculty, uh, Greg uh, giving a talk. And I got to tell you that that lecture series is, the attendance is variable. And I, I just distinctly remember the auditorium being packed uh, to hear Greg talk. And I think that speaks a lot when your institution uh, is excited and interested to hear your work. And he, you'll see he's a great speaker. Um, everything he's done uh, for, for children have, has been so important. He's the principal investigator of the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, 
which is a group of institutions that he um, leads, 31 sites throughout the U.S., that track patients between that were diagnosed that are five year survivors between 1970 and 1999. And a lot of important work has come from that. And we're really looking forward to the next generation of studies where we track our patients um, from 2000 to the future and um, hoping that we've made progress uh, as a result of what we've learned from Dr. Armstrong's studies and others. So thanks so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Tanya. It's really humbling uh, to hear you say those things. So thank you. And thank you for the invitation. I had a wonderful time yesterday with your division. So thank you for hosting me. So I want to talk about the lifetime impact of childhood cancer and childhood cancer therapy. And as I do, I have a number of goals. I'm going to start by helping you rethink success in pediatric oncology. We call success five-year survival, uh, overall survival, event-free survival. I'm going to challenge that and help you rethink that. I'm going to take only a few minutes and talk about the rationale for a large cohort of survivors in the, on a model that we use for late effects research, but all that should take about 10 minutes or less. And then we're going to dive into the latest results, uh, results from the last year or two from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study with the overarching goal of translating findings. I mean, this is an observational epidemiologic study, but translating those findings into effective strategies that reduce risk for treatment-related complications and improve the quality of life of survivors. Our findings have to lead to the next steps that change care. So it really is one of the wonders of modern medicine uh, that 85% of children will survive their cancer. If you go back 50 or 60 years, that number was probably 20%. In doing so, we've created a population of people that never existed before. And here they are. Uh, and that first wave is now aging into their 50s and 60s. In 2018, there were an estimated 483,000 survivors of childhood cancer in the United States. We estimate there's probably more than half a million now. And um, importantly, uh, this figure um, early in my career helped open my eyes to focus on the problem in this group. And I think I keep, I keep using it over the years to help your eyes see the problem. This is um, the so this is the cause specific late mortality among survivors of childhood cancer. Now look very carefully at this point, year five, the beginning of this graph. This is five years from diagnosis. This is when you walk into a room as an oncologist and say, good job, you did it. You're a five year survivor. Uh, you throw confetti, you celebrate, and you should, right? But look at the risk for late mortality from that time on among five year survivors. And there are five year survivors with recurrent disease in this population. The blue curve represents the cumulative mortality due to death from recurrence or progression of the primary cancer. And very clearly, that plateaus with time. Uh, the, the gray curve, and now I've lost my arrow, there we go, is death due to external causes. This is accidents, injuries, trauma, suicide. It's about 1%, even out to 20 or 30 years. But when we broke this mortality into its specific causes, what really stood out was this gold curve. Whatever that is, the slope is rapidly changing 20 to 30 years out. And it's beginning to go straight up. We should look at that and go, what in the world is doing that? Well, these are deaths due to non-recurrence or non-external causes, all other causes. These are medical causes of death. And in this young population, they're mostly treatment-related causes of death. They're long-term effects, death from long-term effects. And when you ask what's driving that, when we look at standardized mortality ratios, which are observed to expected ratios, our survivors have a 15-fold greater risk of death due to a subsequent malignant neoplasm than the general population has risk for death. And they have a seven-fold risk of cardiac death compared to the general population. So it's second cancer deaths and uh, cardiac deaths that are driving this, but there are many others. Now, how do we rethink success? This is a very important paper that came out in JCO in 2021 by Anna Lynn Williams. And she looked at SEER and looked at patients diagnosed with cancer between 0 and 20, between 1975 and 2016. And her metric of interest were excess deaths, a very simple, absolute number, number of observed deaths minus those expected from the general population. And what she showed by year in this figure is that over time, there are a reduced number of excess deaths if you're only looking at death um, at five years. But when she adds in deaths between five and 10 years, goes up, um, but in a relative way. When you look at deaths beyond 10 years, you see something that's fairly dramatic. We're pushing these survivors out as they get beyond the 10-year time point, and then they're dying there, right? So what that happens is effectively, if you look at the top line, you can see it, it makes the overall mortality curve flatline. It erases that five-year overall survival win 
that we keep talking about. So, but he, basically we're pushing them out to die in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and that's not okay, right? So therein lies the problem, is if we're gonna think of success in pediatric oncology, we've gotta walk them all the way through. And that's what this lecture is really about. Now it's important in this paper to break this down by diagnosis. That was all cancer patients, but what about by diagnosis? Well, you see very different figure. For childhood ALL, not only are deaths in the first five years, excess deaths coming down, you don't really create a survivor population that moves out beyond 10 years and dies of disease or dies of their late effects. Well, that's pretty impressive. That's the goal. That's what we want to see. On opposite hand, if you look at our Hodgkin's lymphoma survivors, great improvements in reducing excess death in the first five years, but we push them out to have a tremendous amount of late effects and a tremendous risk for mortality. Uh, and this is what we have to fix. And then here's the figure for CNS tumors. So I take all this and I'm going to leave you with two key questions from this data that we're going to answer later in the talk. And number one is, what are the specific causes of death? We don't know what they are. We can't really change this. And then secondly, can we modify this risk? Can we do anything about it? And hopefully the answer is yes. So this really gets into the rationale for a survivor cohort study. Um, and that is that when you go back to the 1990s, Les Robison, the founder of the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, along with everyone else in the field, acknowledged that there were limitations in what any single institution can do. The small number of survivors at your institution and everyone's institution limits what can be done. Uh, there was also a lack of extended follow-up when they graduate from their pediatric institution and go off into the real world. We really weren't tracking them and didn't have the ability to. So for all of these reasons, there was a need for a study. So in 1994, uh, he first funded the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study and now has 31 participating institutions, including your institution uh, here at at Stanford. So many people in the room who I give a lot of credit to and many people who aren't in the room, such as Mike Link uh, and some of the, the earlier founders of the study here at Stanford. So the CCSS is funded on a U24 from the National Cancer Institute. It's a multi-institutional study, 31 institutions across the United States and Canada. Over 38,000 for five-year survivors of childhood cancer are eligible. Um, and we've published over 390 abstracts, over 420 publications. This is a resource for investigators. And so it's an open resource. And, and so we want to demonstrate its use. Um, but more about the methodology of the study, it is a retrospective cohort study. So we went back in time after diagnosis had occurred, after five-year survivorship had occurred, we went back, captured that data, and now follow them forward in a longitudinal way. Be eligible, a child had to be five and alive, five-year survivor and alive, regardless of the status of their disease. We have a broad array of primary cancer diagnoses, detailed treatment data collected. We went to all 31 institutions and abstracted the medical records and uh, a wide range of outcomes. And of those 38,000 eligible, 25,000 are actively participating. We cover a broad uh, array of cancer diagnoses and importantly, large numbers within these cancer diagnoses. So over 7,000 survivors of childhood leukemia, over 4,000 uh, survivors of childhood brain tumors, for example. And because we're geographically diverse, we're relatively ethnically and racially diverse, uh, especially compared to our European counterpart cohorts. So these survivors completed a baseline questionnaire. This is largely self-reported outcomes, patient-reported outcomes. Uh, the survivors completed it themselves if they were over 18. If they were under 18, uh, their parents completed it for them as a proxy. We collected the treatment information, as I mentioned, so detailed cumulative dose chemotherapy information, detailed radiation dosimetry by body region and organ. We have a repository where we collect buccal cell DNA and blood on the population. We have a pathology center that confirms self-reported subsequent malignant neoplasms. They, grab, they get the pathology report from the outside adult community hospital. We confirm that. Uh, and if we can, we store tissue on those subsequent neoplasms. We link with the national index, death index so that we have mortality data. And very importantly, we have a comparison population, comparison population of 5,000 siblings. By this point in time, survivors in the study have had the opportunity to complete a baseline in up to seven follow-up studies. Follow-up eight is currently in the field. And we have a nice organizational structure. Uh, the working groups are uh, six in number, and I call these the, the pistons on the CCSS engine. These are our working group leaders across key areas that really drive the science of the research and interact with investigators. All right, that's a little bit about the study, a little bit about uh, a model for research, and then we're going to dive into data. 
So as we think about survivorship research, uh, it begins with discovery and reporting of health-related and quality of life outcomes, prevalence, incidence, risk factors. Uh, this is what an epidemiologic observational study should do. In doing so, we can then identify the highest risk populations. That's the important group, most important group we want to follow. But we can't stop there. Once we identify these high-risk groups, there are three areas we want to go forward. The development of clinical care guidelines, the development of clinical risk prediction models, and the development of intervention strategies that ultimately can be trialed for efficacy. And then all three of these things should then be disseminated and implemented so they go back to the survivor, right? It needs to come full circle and result in primary prevention, changing how we treat patients, or secondary prevention, changing how we care for them after treatment when we can't change the treatment. So that is the model. So we're going to follow that model around the circle, and I'm going to give you the latest update on what CCSS has done to do this. So we're going to start with overall mortality. And this is a paper that is now in press in Lancet. I expect that it'll be released in February at some point. But this was led by Stephanie Dixon, and she wanted to answer that mortal those mortality questions that I posed to you earlier about excess deaths. And uh, the advantage of CCSS is that treatment information and the detailed longitudinal follow-up. So I'll show you how we've leveraged that. So this is excess risk of death compared to the U.S. population. And what you see here um, on the x-axis is time from a diagnosis. And on the y-axis, the excess deaths per 10,000 years. So this isn't an absolute number. It's a rate. But what you see here is a very much a U-shaped curve where at five to nine years, there's a very high number of excess deaths per 10,000. In fact, um, it is, should be here on the slide, um, there's 95 per 10,000 all cause, and of them, only 21 of those 95 are health-related causes. So they're largely driven by the gray curve, which is death due to recurrence or progression of the primary cancer. But the face of mortality changes, as I taught you earlier, that by the time there are 35 to 40, these are the other health-related causes, pulmonary death, cardiac death, subsequent neoplasm death that are driving. And at that point, um, more than 40 years, the all-cause excess deaths per 10,000 is 138, and the health-related is 131. So health-related causes are driving this. This is not new. This is just another way of reframing what I showed you earlier. But what is new is we've never been able to look at deep dive of ICD cause of death data. We've always grouped it, pulmonary, cardiac. Uh, you know, subsequent neoplasms in those broad categories. But Stephanie was able to use a, a well-established coding algorithm and code these deaths uh, down to 130 different groups. And so the leading cause of death, not surprising, are subsequent malignant neoplasms, a nine-fold risk in our population compared to the risk of cancer death in the general population, heart disease, four-fold risk compared to the general population. But surprise, flu and pneumonia. This is before COVID. Um, Eight-fold risk for death in long-term survivors decades down the road from their cancer therapy for flu and pneumonia. An eight-fold risk of sepsis in this population, death from sepsis compared to the general population. That's interesting. Um, stroke, five-fold increased risk, kidney failure, six-fold. So uh, these are six of the common ten, top ten causes of death in the general population. So our, our survivors are actually dying of common causes of death. They're just doing it decades earlier. We've got to understand why. But the second question, if you remember, is can we change this risk? Can we do anything to impact this mortality? So Stephanie looked, as this population is aged, at their modifiable risk factors. And I'm just going to show you their health behaviors, their smoking status, their alcohol use, their physical activity, and their obesity or underweight status. And uh, she created a, a scoring uh, algorithm here where basically we categorized the population into three groups, the healthy, the moderately healthy, and the unhealthy. And then she looked at mortality again based on these groups. And this is what we felt was fairly striking. And you can, without even seeing this up close, you can see a very big difference when you get to age 40 when it comes to excess risk of death. The healthy lifestyle versus the unhealthy lifestyle, dramatically different. This is eye-poppingly different, right? Now, this is an observational study. We can't draw causality here, but we can say that healthy lifestyle is associated with fewer excess deaths in this population. And clearly from this you should take that interventions targeting lifestyle as these survivors age across the lifespan should be evaluated to determine if they can reduce risk for late mortality. So we can't change their therapy. We may be able to modify other things that give them a shot at extending their lifespan. So now I'm going to dive into some of the specific outcomes. We've talked about mortality. Let's talk about the 
chronic health conditions that undergird and lead to late mortality. So we'll start with subsequent cancers, and I'm going to start with subsequent breast cancer. A recent paper just published in JAMA Oncology last year by Tara Henderson and Aya Moskowitz looked at reduction in risk attributable to changes in therapy. Basically, from 1970 to 1999, we changed how we treated survivors. We reduced chest radiation doses in many of our populations. And did that potentially lead to a decreased risk for long-term breast cancer? So among 11,000 women uh, developed who, in the study who have now at this point developed 583 breast cancers, the cumulative incidence of breast cancer is 18% among women by age 55. But we looked by treatment era, and Tara and colleagues found that those survivors treated in the 1970s had a higher risk than those from the 1980s and 1990s. By age 40, it's roughly 5% cumulative incidence for those in the 80s and 90s, and a higher incidence, 8% from the 1970s. We, we knew that too, um, but what we didn't know is this reduction in breast cancer risk that we're seeing in these survivors, what's driving it? Why is that? And so they created a multivariate model uh, that did not include therapy in the model. And the treatment era effect was a relative risk of 0 0.82, 0 0.82, so that's an 18% reduction in risk every five years, reduction in risk for breast cancer. Okay, so why? Well, they theorize that if they included in the model therapy, if therapy is really driving this effect, not treatment era, then it would attenuate the treatment era effect. And that's exactly what they saw. They added chest radiation to the model, they added anthracycline dose to the model, and um, this is complex, but when they added chest radiation dose, the relative risk of treatment era attenuated from 0.82 to 0.89. It moved back towards one. Okay, That's saying that part of that treatment era effect that you're seeing was really due to the reduction of radiation that we've seen over time. When they added anthracyclines and pelvic radiation to the model, it actually moved the risk out from one, the opposite of attenuation. And we said, whoa, why is that? What, what happened there? Well, We've now learned, and I'm going to show you later, that anthracyclines are associated with an increased risk for breast cancer. And that's something we've only learned in the last five or 10 years. So when we think about the evolution of therapy in survivors, we've reduced radiation. We did so by increasing anthracycline dose in some of these patients. And there was a trade-off when it comes to breast cancer risk. So what we can say here is that invasive breast cancer incidence has declined in more recent years, and it's attributable to a reduction in chest radiation exposure, but it's tempered by the increasing use of anthracyclines and the reduction, uh, the decreasing use of pelvic radiation. Another subsequent neoplasm, uh, this is data that was published in Nature Communications in 2021, led by Adam Green from Denver, John Lucas from St. Jude and others. Radiation-induced high-grade glioma, uh, fatal disease. Uh, it is a, a hard thing to diagnose and to talk with a family about. It's largely incurable. Um, this population looked at 32 radiation-induced high-grade gliomas and their tissue uh, from our biobank, from the Denver Biobank, and from St. Jude, pulled those rare tumors together and did a number of studies. Um, I'm going to focus mostly for the sake of time on the gene expression patterns in group B, where they identified that there was a, a subset of this group that had depleted expression of DNA repair genes. And uh, this was their report from Nature Communications. And this has led them to raised the question, and they're now exploring this with an R01 application, is whether germline mutations and DNA repair genes may place some of these survivors at higher risk. So if they have radiation to the brain and they uh, might have you know, these germline mutations and can't repair from radiation, they may be the ones at risk for this. So wouldn't it be nice if we could identify before we treat someone their potential pretreatment risk for radiation-induced high-grade glioma. We're a long way from that. This is just the beginning, but this is how you do it. You have to have the tissue, and you have to start moving forward in small ways with rare diseases. So from here, you can we could draw the conclusion that molecular characterization of other subsequent malignant neoplasms may also identify populations at high risk and opportunities uh, for early detection or prevention. And so that's what we're doing. We now have um, a supplement award from childhood uh, from the CCDI, the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, looking at uh, somatic tissues across three major subsequent neoplasm groups, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, meningioma. We're doing whole genome and whole exome sequencing, uh, both germline and somatic tissue on this population with the goal of assessing uh, how the effects of prior therapy on the genetic uh, genomic landscape of these three tumors, and then modeling the timing of mutation acquisition. And this is led by Jingwei Zhang at St. Jude, who's chair of our computational biology department. So hopefully some exciting results in the next few years on this. 
All right, moving away from second cancer, let's talk about cardiac disease for just a minute. We spent an hour talking about it yesterday, so I'll try not to bore you too much again. But um, sevenfold risk for death uh, due to cardiac disease, I showed you in the early slides. So what's underlying that? Well, survivors have an increased risk for coronary artery disease. Uh, the cumulative incidence by age 45 among survivors treated with chest radiation uh, is 9%. For those not treated with chest radiation, is 1%. For the sibling population, 0.3%. Clearly an increased risk. We've known this. This is not new. But what is new is that we're learning more and more about the radiation dose that may injure the valves and injure the heart and cause cardiomyopathy. Uh, we've known from the past that doses down to about 10 gray can increase risk for cardiac disease. And here you see in the 10 to 19 gray region, a 2.5 fold increase risk for cardiac disease. So that's old news. More recently, we want to get more exquisite with how we think about radiation, because radiation, just looking at the mean dose to the heart, is sort of a, a blunt edged tool. But if we can know dose to the uh, to the coronary arteries or dose to the ventricles, it might give us more insight. And so a paper that is now under revision at JCO is uh, looking at just that. And so James Bates and Rebecca Howell now looking at these focused substructures can tell us that when we look at dose to the tricuspid valve, a dose as low as 5 to 10 gray can increase risk for uh, valve abnormalities by fivefold. So that's not a small risk. And uh, no one sits around and thinks that 5 gray is a lot of radiation, but it actually matters. So this is important because our radiation oncologists now can contour dose in a tremendous way. And you can bet if your radiation oncologist knew this, they would make a little extra effort to keep it off the heart. I'm sure they're doing that anyway, but this would give them the data to say, yes, if you can contour it off the valve, uh, you're actually going to you know, improve their long-term cardiac outcomes. So same is true for right ventricle. And, and then if you look at LAD, coronary artery disease, uh, coronary artery radiation exposure in the 5 to 10 gray range, you double the risk of uh, coronary artery disease. So uh, these are important data that um, hopefully will be published in the next few months. So low-dose radiation exposure to specific cardiac substructures increases risk. Strategies that reduce radiation exposure are needed. So how do we translate this forward? Well, this team is doing it. They now have an R01 funded uh, that will try to develop personalized risk prediction models to reduce cardiovascular disease in childhood cancer survivors, led by Rebecca Howell, Dan Mulrooney, and Yutaka Yasui. The overarching goal of this R01 is to improve radiation delivery. So going full circle, take the data back, improve radiation delivery um, by, number one, developing in St. Jude Life, another one of our cohorts, and then validating in CCSS risk, risk prediction models that incorporate these substructure doses. And even two, integrating models into commercial radiation treatment planning systems. So if your radiation oncologist had the model in their planning system, they contour the dose and see the long-term improvement in late effects, in front of their eyes, you can bet that could have an impact. So that's the goal, is ultimately translating this forward. So let's move off of end organ injury and go to some larger, broader concepts. One is frailty. As our survivors age, we've been watching them, and many of us who see them in clinics say, you know, they look older beyond their years, older than their chronological age. And we've wondered if there's a risk for accelerated aging. Frailty has been a metric to begin to wrap our head around this phenotype. And frailty is a geriatric measure that looks at low lean muscle mass, self-exhaustion, low energy expenditures, slow walking speed, weakness. And we published a few years ago that um, in our population in the childhood cancer survivor study, 5.8% of survivors are frail. That compares to our siblings where only 2% were frail. And if you went to a general population data set uh, with an average age of 50, 4% are frail. Our population at this point was about age 35. So at a much younger age, uh, they have higher rates of frailty. So that's one measure. But we're looking at other measures, and one is uh, the cumulative incidence rating scale, another geriatric measure. But what's interesting about this study is while the last study was cross-sectional, this study is leveraging longitudinal data to look at acceleration of comorbidities. Are they developing them at the same rate as the general population, or are they actually accelerating? So uh, the cumulative instance rating scale, you shouldn't understand, you know, geriatricians and pediatricians don't often get together, right? So you don't, you're not going to know these measures. That's okay. I don't either. Uh, but we were, we've actually started working with geriatricians. Uh, I actually have a funded grant with a, as a pediatrician with a geriatrician, which I think is fantastic. So um, that's what we're doing. But anyway, um, this is a scale that has um, 14 total organ systems. You can get a total score. You can get all kinds of ways of, of scoring this. But 
the point here is look at these figures stratified by sex and just focus on females, for example, with the red line being our survivors. When you look at the total score on the cumulative instance rating scale for females, you can see the slope is very different than the green or the blue. Um, and the green are our siblings and the blue is in Haynes data, you know, additional representative data set. So it's the slope we're looking at because we have two points in time here. So they're developing chronic conditions, but they're developing them in an accelerated fashion. So the slope is steeper. Um, the risk factors are survivors who've had cranial radiation, chest radiation, high doses of platinums, and females. Um, and a one-point increase in total score increased risk for late mortality by 9%. So don't think of this population as a static injured population that gets to the five-year time point with their burden and they just go forward. They go forward and they snowball. They, they develop more and more in uh, chronic health conditions and it snowballs on them, it accelerates. Uh, and that's how to think of this population. So with two decades of longitudinal follow-up, CCSS provides evidence for accelerated burden of comorbidities consistent with an accelerated aging phenotype. But it's not just uh, physical aging. We've got to think about cognitive aging. So this is late onset new cognitive impairment. This is complicated. Let me try to explain this. So Paul and I both know we have a lot of cognitively injured patients that get to the five-year time point. I'm not stuck. These are not studied in this population. This is the population that gets to the five-year time point and has no cognitive injury. What happens to them as you go forward? So in that population, the prevalence of memory impairment at time two or follow-up uh, among those with no impairment at time one. And you can see that for our CNS tumor survivors, 34% of the population that had no cognitive impairment at our first assessment comes back a decade later and has new onset cognitive impairment. So they were fine, and we probably sent them out of our survivor clinic saying they're fine, but in that next decade, they developed a new cognitive impairment. And it's not just that population. Here's the ALL population who had cranial radiation, roughly about 25%. Uh, here's the Hodgkin's population who uh, didn't have any direct CNS treatment, imagine, so, um, and so on and so forth. But even the siblings, of course, developed some new cognitive um, hits with time, too. So that's one point. But as they looked at this population who developed new cognitive impairment, they asked the question, well, how's your quality of life? And so the red dots are those who were impaired at time two versus the black triangles, those who were not impaired. And you can see when you look at this population, those that are newly impaired also report a lower quality of life. So there's a functional aspect to this as well. Uh, so you've got to think of this aging population as a very dynamic population. There's a critical need to evaluate all survivors for a new onset of health and neurocognitive conditions as they age across the lifespan. All right, let's talk about employment. I found these data striking. This is unemployment among survivors who were previously employed. So again, using longitudinal data among the population that held a full-time job with 11 years of follow-up, if you look at females, you can see that 63% of females, um, and I lost my cursor again. Anyway, 63% of females still had a full-time job. That means a third of females fell out of the workforce in an 11-year period. Why? Well, 9% uh, went to part-time. 7% had a health-related unemployment, 3% unemployed due to other causes, 8% out of the labor force, we don't know why, and 10% died. So this is a big shift. Uh, these are survivors that you might see in clinic and they're employed, but will they be employed in a decade? And what are their risks for unemployment? And what do we know about that? And the answer is next to nothing. Higher field where we've got to learn and understand if we are going to help survivors uh, advance across the lifespan. So shifts in employment status may place survivors at increased risk for financial toxicity, no doubt. So what do we know about financial toxicity? Well, uh, published last year, Paul Nathan, Robin Yabroff from the American Cancer Society uh, looked at this and looked at this now post Affordable Care Act. I think the first paper that I'm aware of that, that looked at financial toxicity post ACA. And whether you looked at behavioral hardship or material hardship or psychological hardship, uh, our survivors outpaced with their mean score. They had higher means than siblings. But when you start drilling down and looking at what was driving this, survivors are more likely to send, be sent to debt collection, 29% versus 22%, more likely to have problems paying medical bills, more likely to forego needed medical care. I put that in all blue. That should strike us as they're uh, twice as likely to forego medical care because of their financial toxicity. Uh, that can't be, right? As a physician, I just say that cannot be. We've got to fix that, right? Um, so intervention strategies are absolutely needed to help survivors navigate health systems. 
So how do we translate that forward? I'll ask you again. Well, I'm thankful to work with Ann Kirchhoff and Elise Park and from Utah, University of Utah, Elise from Harvard, and they have an R01 funded called HINT, Health Insurance Navigation Intervention Tool. Uh, it's a randomized intervention trial in the CCSS population. It's a type one hybrid effectiveness implementation trial. And the primary aim is to determine the effectiveness of two digital patient navigation interventions on improving health literacy in a six month time span. So um, if I could get the cursor to work, I'd, oh, oh, there we go. Um, the, the randomization is to three groups, hint S, which is hint synchronous, um, where you meet with a live navigator via Zoom in a series of uh, four meetings. Uh, hint asynchronous, which is recorded and you can follow it, read, listen to it anytime you want. And then uh, enhanced usual care, which is not having a health navigator. And the bottom line is AIM-1 will look at the effectiveness of six months it's six months of health insurance literacy, but we'll also look at longer term outcomes out to 18 months of does this impact financial hardship, out of pocket costs, and healthcare utilization. So, uh, this study just kicked off in the last year, and we're excited to get it in the field. Okay, um, so we've talked about health related quality of life outcomes. I'm going to move fairly quickly through clinical care guidelines, uh, and I'm going to focus in on one that has not changed guidelines yet, but it should. I was talking to the fellows about this yesterday, but going back to, oh, back about eight or 10 years now, there were a series of papers, one from CCSS and one from our Dutch colleagues, suggesting that uh, breast cancer, there are patients developing subsequent breast cancers who never had chest radiation, and the number was growing, and we couldn't figure out why. And some of the suggestions were that it could be anthracycline. So in a follow-up study in 2020, Lenny Viega um, from the NCI, looked at this in a deeper way in a nested case control study of 271 women with subsequent breast cancer, they found that the odds ratio for breast cancer increased with a cumulative dose of anthracycline. So um, with every 100 milligrams per meter squared of anthracycline, a 23% increase in risk. So this is the first evidence of a dose response effect in anthracyclines and subsequent breast cancer. And then of course you have to think about radiation and chest radiation. So they stratified the population um, you can see the doses that they chose, but they stratified by anthracycline. So in the population with no anthracyclines, uh, when you look at increasing radiation dose, no surprise, there's an increasing risk for breast cancer. When you look at the population had breast uh, had chest radiation and anthracycline exposure, you can see that 10 plus gray, it's twice the risk. So this suggested that there may be an additive effect between anthracyclines and radiation such that one plus one equals two. And that's actually an important finding. So I think we can safely say now there have been a series of other studies. Um, anthracycline chemotherapy increases risk for breast cancer. So you can say, why do we continue to follow survivors? Why would we need to follow them through their 40s? We're discovering in their 40s things we did 30 years ago are now having a health impact on their health. So we're the early warning system for new findings like this. Uh, moving on, clinical risk prediction models. Don't you wish we just had a Framingham calculator for survivors and you could just pull it up in your phone and no risk? Wouldn't that be great? That's what we'd like to have for you. Um, so clinical risk prediction models. Here's one. Uh, this is Haya Moskowitz from Sloan Kettering. She published this in JCO in 2021, predicting breast cancer risk after chest radiation. Well, to have a prediction calculator, you have to have a large suite of risk profiles. You need a lot of patients treated a lot of different ways and with a lot of different covariates. And so in this case, one profile is that if you were a woman age 35 who had whole lung radiation as a child, had anthracycline exposure, had chest radiation within one year of menarche, had a first degree, did not, I'm sorry, did not have chest radiation within one year of menarche, did not have a first degree relative with breast cancer, you're still menstruating, your five-year risk for breast cancer as a subsequent neoplasm is 10%, your 10-year risk is 18%. I'm sure that woman would want to know that, right? And we should be able to provide that as a tool at the bedside for you and the patient. So um, I won't go into the details of these, how this performed just for the sake of time, but I will show you that you can now go to our CCSS website and find this breast cancer probability calculator in a suite of other calculators for cardiovascular risk, acute ovarian failure. Um, and this month we're adding renal failure because of a, a paper that will come out soon. So uh, there it is for you. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to go past um, risk prediction models of quality of life, but we can now, uh, this is a fantastic paper in JAMA Network Open that actually uh, 
had some pretty impressive models predicting quality of life. And in the end, the punchline is we can group survivors now based on risk factors into a population that is at extremely low risk for developing a physical component summary, SF36, low quality of life, and a population that's at high risk. We can actually anticipate those who are going to struggle. We also, when we think about risk prediction models, now have to think about the genome and their, their genetics, their genetic predisposition for late effects, their genetic predisposition to metabolize or not metabolize their chemotherapy or radiation, right? So here's just one example. Yadov uh, Sepkota published in Nature Medicine last year, a uh, risk prediction model looking at severe obesity. We're talking morbid obesity, a BMI over 40. And, and Paul and I have many of those patients in our clinic, unfortunately, due to hypothalamic obesity. So. The aim here was to determine the contribution of a genetic risk score, the kind of genetic risk score used in the general population, to improve risk prediction for severe obesity in our population. So uh, this genetic risk score of common variants was found to have a, be associated with a 53-fold odds of increased risk for morbid obesity. That is gigantic. So what it's telling us is we have our treatment-related causes of obesity, but then there are the underlying genetic causes of obesity that they bring into the situation that really, really matter. Um, and so this improved the AUC in these models. So the red model is a clinical model plus lifestyle factors. The green model is a clinical plus lifestyle plus rare variants. But when you add in the common variants, you can see the AUC bumps up significantly from the 60s to the mid-70s, 0.75. So uh, actually... The genetic predisposition for obesity that they bring to this is just as important as the treatment, and we've got to take all that into effect if we're going to build risk prediction models. Just as a plug, because we're a resource, I want you to know this data is available for you. Uh, if you have an interesting question in survivors, we have genotype data on almost 6,000 survivors. You can download it from dbGaP. We have whole exome data on that same population. You can get it in dbGaP. And we've got whole genome sequencing and whole exome data on another 2,600 that's available through the St. Jude Cloud. And in the last year, we've put all our phenotype data on dbGaP. So you can come to us and work with us on a study, or you can just go to dbGaP and download the data and, and do it yourself. So we're publicly available as much as we possibly can be, and the accession number is here at the bottom of the slide. So finally, getting on to intervention, changing the trajectory for survivors. I'm going to show you a paper that just came out in JCO uh, in the last month, I think. Um, this is Advancing Survivors' Knowledge About Skin Cancer, the ASK study run by Alan Getter, Geller out of Harvard. So radiation therapy results in survivors having a 30 to 40-fold risk of non-melanoma skin cancer and a 2 to 3-fold risk of melanoma. If that's the case, we need to think about strategies to screen for that. Uh, skin cancers are the most common subsequent neoplasm among survivors, and so it's actually a problem. The primary aim of the study was to determine the impact on skin cancer early detection practices in our survivors. So it was a three-arm randomization. The first arm was patient activation and education. The second arm brought in physicians for their activation and education. And the third arm was a nifty arm that employed, for the first time for CCSS, when we rolled this out seven years ago, teledermatology. So you know, um, M health. my goodness. Doesn't seem so new now, but <laughs> it really did seven years ago. And so um, the primary outcomes were among survivors exposed to radiation therapy to look at 12 months and 18 months and see if we have an impact on skin examination, at least one physician's skin examination, and then at least one thorough self-examination. So those are the two endpoints. So uh, the first group, patient activation education, got all kinds of nice materials uh, educating them about um, skin cancer. They had access to a website to give them more information. They could meet their researcher. They could meet Alan. For physicians, we sent additional materials to educate them about skin cancer in our survivors. And then for ARM3, we sent them uh, this lens that you attach to the back of your phone. If you have a suspicious molar lesion, you simply take a high-resolution picture and send it to the study dermatologist, and they'll give you guidance. So could mobile health advance uh, this, the diagnosis of skin cancer? Well, here's what we found. At baseline, these three arms were relatively similar. And at 12 months, when you look at physician skin exam, we doubled, almost doubled the rate of skin exam, but there was no difference between the arms. And when you look at self-skin, uh, self-exam, the last two months, same is true, almost doubled the rate of self-skin exams, but no difference between the arms. And thankfully, some sustainability at 18 months, at the end, six months after the end of the study, the impact was sustained. And then when you look at body parts, which was uh, the uh, total body parts that were um, examined, Again, a very similar effect. So this was actually a null study. 
there was no winner. This was a comparative effectiveness study with no winner. Thing is, is there is a winner. Uh, while there were no differences between the arms, skin cancer screening doubled in every arm, which doubling when you, in a health behavior, if you double a screening practice, that's pretty fantastic. Now, it's still less than 50%, so there's a long way to go. But the encouraging part is even the most simple arm nearly doubled skin, skin cancer screening. So don't bother with the teledermatology or talking to their physician. You can do it in a more simple way and get the same effect. We have a number of other intervention trials that are going on, and I can't get into them in much detail. I, we have developed in the last five years a mobile platform. Every survivor has a uh, portal, uh, their personal research portal that they can enter into. They complete their surveys now online or on their phone. Uh, so we stepped into the modern age. And just for the sake of time, there's a couple other interventions that I'm just going to push right past uh, and kind of get to the end here. And that is where we're going to go in the future. We are now in year two of a current five-year award, just started year two. And in this time period, we're going to really move into aging, accelerated aging. The average age of the cohort is 40 at this point, health services research, and then data sharing. So when it comes to aging and accelerated aging, here is our, our goal for the next five years, that we'll expand the collection of data to evaluate the physiologic and neurocognitive function with age and how it changes, characterize accelerated aging, and investigate the underlying physiology of aging as survivors enter their fourth, fifth, and sixth decades of life. So we have a, a number of new measures in our survey that we put out every two years. We've added a web-based neurocognitive assessment. So our previous neurocognitive assessment was a self-report paper-based assessment. Uh, this is now web-based. Uh, they have a, it's basically a 10-minute exam on their home computer. So we'll actually have a direct assessment of their cognitive function. It's called CNS Vital Signs. We'll do this twice in the five-year period, so we have longitudinal data. And then we're developing a sub cohort, a subpopulation that we go into the home and actually meet them personally and, and measure things and then get this sub cohort of 1,000 ready for intervention trials on aging and accelerated aging. Health services, I pointed this out as a gap earlier. Uh, given the unique healthcare needs of survivors, we're going to enhance CCSS uh, through the collection of data to evaluate patient, provider, and health system factors. It's a huge unknown how they interact with the health system and how that is or isn't helping them. Um, and look at associations with access quality and cost of care. And so we've, again, updated our surveys to do a lot of new measures within the surveys, and we've added expertise. Claire Snyder from Johns Hopkins is uh, really a leader in health services research among survivors of adult cancers, and she is now joining Paul Nathan as a working group chair for cancer control and intervention working group, and this is a fantastic addition. Thirdly, uh, we're going to continue to enhance data sharing. So if you've never heard of the St. Jude Cloud Survivorship Portal, Go there, take a look. Uh, you can play with the data and all the visualizations and, and just have a, a field day. Um, the current data there is the St. Jude Lifetime Cohort. We're going to put CCSS on the cloud as well so that between these two cohorts, you have 48,000 survivors' data available for your access. It now, as of last month, can be downloaded, so you can download the data and do your own analyses. Um, with that, I'll end and just remind you that things I've shown you here, this is not my work team science at its best, and the team is big. Uh, the, the point of this slide was to impress you with the fact that you probably can't read most of these names, and I don't think I got everybody. There's more. This has uh, been a fantastic opportunity to come and talk to you, and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. I was um, impressed by the, uh, I guess, the um, uh, prevalence of frailty, as was defined in your study, was around 5% of the survivals. And I'm assuming as we move forward, this number, of course, is fluid, right? So it might increase with time as as um, uh, the, the time period that you're looking at. So this is a, uh, a um, uh, uh, like a, a cross-sectional, sort of look at a particular time where you have different ages, I would I would suspect, just to confirm that. And then I was surprised that steroids weren't associated with that. So you mentioned the association with platinum and uh, and the radiation. Just the radiation and the thing. cranial radiation. Yeah. So what are, are how, how strong is the data to exclude the other agents? Or do you think that there might be other players there too? 
Uh, there may be with time, as with time we have more frail survivors, we'll probably learn of additional risk factors, but no, none of the other chemotherapies were significant. Um, and we do know a little bit about the progression of frailty. Uh, Kiri Ness just published from the St. Jude Lifetime Cohort, I think it's in JNCI from this last year, that uh, that rate, that number doubles in about a five-year time span. We were really shocked. We thought it would be fairly static or you know, progress fairly slowly, but it almost doubled in five, I think a 4%. It went from about, you know, in, in the St. Jude Lifetime cohort from five to about 9% in just a five-year time period. So we were, we were, and that was doing direct assessment because in St. Jude Life, they come in and have an assessment at St. Jude. So that's with even better outcome measures, that rate doubles pretty quickly. Right, very nice talk, Greg. So you hit it through the St. Jude Life study, but uh, the bugaboo of epidemiology, gene environment interactions. So... The problem being, how are we going to incorporate that in the CCSS where you don't necessarily have, you know, genomes on all these patients? I mean, it, I think it's key. I mean, what's going on in brain tumors? We know so many of them are now genetic predispositions that we didn't know even five years ago. Yeah, you know, we only have whole genome data on about 2,600 in CCSS. The St. Jude Lifetime cohort has whole genome data on everybody, um, and so they're they're a little better tooled to handle those things. Thanks, Greg. That was a great talk. I have a question about the breast cancer um, predisposition and how you incorporated or not um, BRCA mutations into the risk of development of, the, of breast cancer. Yeah, so in CCSS, there's no data on that. Um, from St. Jude Life, Jiao Ming Wang published now probably four years ago in JCO looking at um, genetic predisposition and risk for all cancers. And uh, overall, in the St. Jude Life population, uh, I believe it was four to five percent have a predisposition gene of some sort. I believe the BRCA1 was the second most common uh, gene among those genes. You know, if you look at that study closely, among the women who had radiation, the effect was less than among those who didn't have radiation, as you can imagine. And really, one of the take homes from that paper, you know, we we think about the radiation group and their need for seeing a genetic counselor, and we often don't think about the other group. Um, but what we learned from that study is we've got to think about the other group who didn't get radiation, that, that there's a significant number of them who will develop, and, and we've never really accounted for that. Thank you. Um, the increased rate of financial toxicity amongst survivors, is there any insight into why does it have to do with the increased cost of care with initial treatment, or are there other factors? It is probably so multifactorial that it would make you pull your hair out. Uh, I think we have, I mean, when you, when you start seeing these patients at ground level and taking care of them, there's a different problem for every patient. And so it is, it is going to be a very, very complex problem. There are things we have to think about. Models of care would be one big framework. What's the right model of care for a long-term survivor? Should they all be seeing their primary doctor? Should there be some hybrid approach of they all have an oncologist and their primary doctor? We don't even know the right model of care to begin with. Um, we know a little bit more about insurance. For example, I can tell you that insurance rates are not that much lower. You know, 92% of our siblings have insurance where 90% of survivors. So that's not striking, but the quality of the insurance is very different. So when you go down to the deeper level and look at the quality of the insurance, our survivors have much lower quality insurance. They're less likely to have employer-based insurance. That's one example. And they're afraid, uh, getting to what you say, they're afraid of losing their job and losing their insurance. The idea of job lock we have higher rates of job lock in our survivors uh, than we do in the sibling population. And we've published all these things. So um, we're beginning to learn, but we really don't know. I mean, when I, that health services slide I mentioned, we, we really don't know how they're accessing care. We don't really, we just, we've never asked. And um, they're now of the age where we've got to know. Okay, so we have a couple of online questions. Um, one from Sahar Aminipur. Do you do anything with the MIT Age Lab? Any collaborations with the Age Lab at the MIT? I'm not sure. The, uh, an aging lab at MIT is that? Yeah. Not familiar with it, unfortunately. We've, we've most most of our collaborations have been been with the Mayo Clinic. Yeah. Uh, Jim Kirkland's the head of geriatrics, and he's we've we've collaborated quite a bit with Mayo. Um, Harvey Cohen is asking: Do you have any evidence for early onset known neurodegenerative? Sorry, neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, et cetera, among your survivors? And, and how does irradiation affect that? So, yeah, we haven't seen any uh, Parkinson's that we're aware of. 
Um, Alzheimer's, no, but MCI, mild cognitive impairment, has, has always been an idea that we've wondered, you know, that sort of pre-Alzheimer's. And so there's been some literature, very small literature on that. But that, I think looking for mild cognitive impairment, that pre-Alzheimer's is something that will be increasingly important as we as we go. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, Ch Lisa Chamberlain is asking, last week in our grand rounds, we learned about advanced aging due to epigenetic changes, specifically telomere shortening. Uh, beyond looking at frailty with phenotype, are you guys looking at epigenetics? So glad you asked. Um, in CCSS, not as much. In St. Jude Life, our other cohort, absolutely. So we looked at epigenetic aging. Epigenetic age acceleration um, is accelerating faster in survivors than our siblings. We know that. We know that epigenetic age acceleration is associated with the therapy they received, uh, many of their social determinants of health in the now, and associated with long-term risk of health outcomes. So uh, that could be a, a pretty amazing biomarker when you think about it, uh, to look at their epigenetic age acceleration and realize this could be a high-risk population down the road. So that's one. But we've looked at St. Jude Life. Uh, Xiaoming Wang has done all of this data. Um, He's looked at telomere length in St. Jude Life and found that um, the telomere length shortening really parallels that, but with a frame shift of siblings. So they take an early hit in their telomere length, but from there, they uh, lose telomere length at the same rate. But the epigenetic age acceleration has an entirely different slope together. So there are about nine markers of aging in geriatric that geriatricians use, and we're looking at a lot of them, actually, in, at St. Jude. Uh, one more does um, from Suni Anand. Does CCSS or St. Jude Life collect hair samples? No, but we've thought about it. We've also thought about uh, fingernail and toenails, but we've yeah. never never done that. We've also thought about stool samples, but as great it would be to have that data, <laughs> having twenty thousand people send their stool is something we haven't gone for yet. <laughs> so uh, the mail, through the mail that the post office might not like us. I don't know. Great questions though. We we have thought about all those things. Any other questions from? It's a great talk. Um, I'm the radiation oncologist who treats most of the PEDS patients here. So I thought super interesting. Um, also good to see some other things being held responsible in addition to yes. my instrument. Um, yes. One question I had was one from one of your earlier slides. I may have misread or maybe not about the breast cancer uh, risk attribution with decreased chest radiation, increased anthracyclines. I think on the slide it said also tempered by decreased use of pelvic radiation, yeah, yeah. Um, which I'm wondering, is that just a marker for more intensive chemo and? No, um, you know, the earliest, the first paper that Peter Inskip published more than a decade ago showing a linear dose response between radiation and the risk for breast cancer, also knows the women who had more than five gray of radiation to the ovaries Okay. Uh, had a reduced risk. So it's reducing that estrogen uh, from the ovaries. Well, we've decreased pelvic radiation doses. And what's happened is, you know, that was the, that risk reduction that came with that pelvic radiation is now not there. So it's complex. I, I didn't want to dive into it, but that, that explains it. Got so, it. So remember, you need us to treat the ovaries again. We can do that. Uh, <laughs> do not, that's not the conclusion. No, <laughs> less, less is better. Uh, I will tell you, um, you know, radiation oncologists are not the bad guys, right? right. You guys save lives. You're, you're, you're getting their cures. Um, when I came to St. Jude 17 years ago and started publishing a few of these papers, every time I'd publish a paper, I'd, the next morning I'd get a 7 a.m. call from Larry Kahn, uh, <laughs> the, head, the head of radiation. He would call me directly in my office and say, Greg, I saw your paper, but remember, we're not the bad guy. <laughs> uh, and I got a few of those calls. And so I really do appreciate not only what you're saying, but, but we've got to remember cures first. Yeah. Can't sacrifice cure. Yeah, I know it's great talk. You have a great team there and John Lucas and the rest of the right. um really, really impressive. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. Fantastic talk. Really appreciate your time. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.